if you're on the prayer line, you know that we requested prayer for a young man, a very godly young man who was very involved in his church in uh, Pennsylvania. He was hit by a car when his car broke down and he moved to the side to work on the vehicle and someone struck him. He was in a coma and he passed away. He went to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, you know there's no purgatory, right? And when we talked about Sheol or Hades last week in our message of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, we made that distinction that that place for the unrighteous dead where they're held temporarily is still occupied. Everyone who would die not believing, not in faith, would enter that place we call Hades in the New Testament, Sheol in the Old. And they are there until the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is at the, book, the end of the book of the Revelation, and it deals with the judgment of the unrighteous dead. But as Pastor David alluded to in his closing comments, we, the believers, stand before the Vima, or Bema seat of Christ. It's B-E-M-A, but it's pronounced Vima. And it is the seat of a judge in athletic competition where you're rewarded for how well you have run the race. You're rewarded for how well you have fought the fight. You're rewarded for how well as a good farmer you have planted and worked the seed, the seed of God's word. And so you're not punished for what you haven't done, but you're given rewards for what you have done. When all is said and done, the only thing that matters is what we've done for Christ, for his sake, for the gospel, for his name, right? So, but, but nonetheless, that young man's passing is very grievous for those involved in my friend's church in Pennsylvania and for his family. And then grief upon grief. Did any of you read of the young lady who was hit by a stray bullet in the head in Illinois as she was reading the Bible to her daughter? Well, that was John, John's great niece, Pastor John. So it was grief upon grief. Now, the, the, the joy is that that young lady who was in nursing school, 23 years old, two children, loved the Lord with all of her heart. Her testimony of her love for Jesus was overwhelming. So we know where she is today, too. But is it not a grief to her husband, to her mother, father, to her family, to her church family that loved her? Is not death a tremendous grief to all of us? On the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And it's true. But physical death was meant to bring about the reality, the sobriety of the fact that, that sin not only leads to physical death, but sin will lead to an eternal death, an eternal separation from God, which we would not want anyone, anyone to experience, would we? No. No. The pain and the sorrow of of losing someone in this life physically, temporarily, right? Because, because for those who we love, who know the Lord, when they pass on, we don't say goodbye. What do we say? See you later. See you later. And it'll be sooner rather than later because this life is just but a vapor. But the real, real tragedy for every service I have ever had, every funeral I've ever had to officiate in, where there was no evidence that the deceased was in the Lord, that is most grievous. That's most painful. To know that that separation is forever. Forever. But God so loved that he sent Jesus, that whoever would believe in Jesus in their heart. Now, there are things that we believe in our heart that our head can't comprehend. Isn't that true? But if one would believe in their heart that Jesus is all he said he was, then eternal life enters into their life at that moment. And that is validated and affirmed in the scriptures repeatedly. Last week, we looked at Lazarus and the rich man, and we saw what was being shared there by Jesus. I believe it wasn't a parable. I believe it was a historical account. Because in parables, Jesus doesn't name names. There's no less than three names named there in Luke chapter 16. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to listen to that message. It's very inspiring, very comforting. Previous to that, I talked about all the resurrections in the Bible so that you would have an absolute assurance of the resurrection that Jesus Christ has promised all of us. How many resurrections are there in the scriptures? No less than 10. How many in the Old Testament? 
three. Then the balance are all in the New Testament, right? But the greatest of all, the goat of all resurrections is whose? Jesus, because he is the firstborn of many brethren. He's not the first resurrection, but because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because of his perfectly sin-free life, because of his substitutionary death, and then his ascension into heaven as the Father affirmed the ministry of Jesus, 40 days after that resurrection, everyone else who died in faith, where did they go? With Jesus to heaven. Yeah. I was at the doctor's office, and the We always have a good time talking about the scriptures with my doctor. His assistant was there, and she's reading a book on heaven. And she started asking me questions about heaven. And I said, what you need to understand, my dear, just as the resurrection is more a person than a doctrine. Truth is more a person than a doctrine, isn't it? Heaven is more a person than a doctrine. It's being in Christ, right? As we sang earlier, the the only way in which we truly live the Christian life is allow the Holy Spirit of God, the person of Jesus Christ, to live his life through us. Christ in me, the hope of glory. For it is you, Lord, who work within me, both to will and to do, according to your good pleasure. And so we've been looking, and I taught you both the number of resurrections throughout the Bible and the story of Lazarus and the rich man as a segue into chapter 11 of John's Gospel, for that's where we are this morning. So turn there, chapter 11, John's Gospel. And as you're turning, can we pray one more time? Lord, there is, there is so much truth that you want us, your children, to comprehend to swallow, to ingest, Lord, just as the angel told John to eat the scrolls, the angel told Daniel, eat the scroll, eat the words, allow your word to penetrate down into our being, Lord. And so I pray that this morning, Lord, that my words would not only be intellectual, Lord, that that it would would touch the minds of those who are hearing, those in in the sanctuary here, those outside under the building, those over the internet, Lord. But not only that it would be intellectually stimulating, Lord, it would be passionate, Lord. It would move them emotionally, Lord, that we touch the head and the heart, Lord. And that through all of that, Lord, you would transform our lives, Lord. As you enlighten our mind and swell our hearts, Lord, change our living. Lord, we don't want to be the same as we leave here this morning as we came in. I surely do not, Lord. I want you to continue to do the work that you have begun, being confident of this very thing, beloved. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, until you're coming, Lord. And so we pray this morning, Lord, would you speak to us? As I have studied, Lord, as I have purposed to know the text, Lord, but I look to you, the Holy Spirit, In spite of what I've learned, in spite of what I might say this morning, Lord, you speak to these, your children. Comfort them, assure them. Lord, put such a confidence in their heart of the resurrection and the life that you have given us now that we would be a changed people, Lord, that our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers would see there's something very different about us, Lord. The hope that we have of eternity. We thank you for that, Jesus. And Lord, I ask you to comfort my friend, John Thomas, and his congregation this morning. Grief upon grief. You love us dearly, Lord, but you never said you would spare us from the pain and the sorrow that's in this world, but that you would be with us through it, Lord. You would comfort us. So we ask for them, Lord, for that comfort. You are the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all, all of our afflictions, sufferings, trials. So bring the comfort that only you can bring, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. And everyone who agrees said, Amen. 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 Chapter 11. This will be the last sign or miracle that John records in his gospel. John has written the gospel of John to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is God. He chose seven very specific miracles, although there were many. He said if, if he recorded everything both Jesus did and taught, the volumes of every library in the world couldn't contain the information that would be there. 
as we would study through that. But he chose these seven in particular to show the proof that Jesus Christ is God. Power over nature, power over death, power over the grave, power over sickness and disease, power in every facet of, in every realm of this life in this universe. Amen? And this will be the last of the signs or miracles. It'll be the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus has already committed two previous resurrections, hasn't he? Who was the first one? Yes, the boy from Nain, the city of Nain, as this funeral procession was taking. When anyone died in this time period during Jesus' day, they had to bury the body in, in what time frame? Within the first 24 hours. The first 24 hours, because they didn't embalm the body the way the Egyptians did. They, they would cleanse the body, preserve the body, wrap the body, but decay would begin immediately. Deterioration of the body. The putrefaction of the flesh. And so this funeral procession was taking place in the city of Nain, and this boy was being carried in the coffin to his resting place, and his mother was a widow. His father had already previously died, and she was in tremendous grief and sorrow. And Jesus had compassion upon her, and he touched the boy, and he rose from the dead. Now, he would have expired less than 24 hours ago. The second miracle Jesus performed was for who? Jairus' daughter. He was the leader, the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. And Jesus heard that she was sick. But his servants came to Jairus as he was even speaking to Jesus and bidding him to come to his house. He said, don't bother the master any longer. Your daughter's dead. Who was the attending physician? Luke. Of all people, Luke. And Jesus said, fear not. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. And so he went. And he said, arise, little girl. Talathakumi. And he rose her from the dead less than 24 hours after she had expired. After she exhaled for the last time. The power behind this miracle, this resurrection, is that we'll find out that how long was Lazarus dead before Jesus rose him from the dead? Four days. Four days. But Jesus is trying to display without beyond a shadow of a doubt his power over death and the grave. Now, I know many of you here, we, we have been grieved, suffered. Our, our lives have been changed, altered, adjusted because of the sting of death. Death has, has brought some lifelong changes to my life. Anybody else get testimony of that? Look at you. So... No less the sting of death experienced by this family that Jesus loved. But he was going to prove his power over death and the joy that would come. One day, beloved, one day, the scriptures declare we're going to see the death of death itself. Sin brought about death. One woman's sin. <laughs> All this trouble. But one man's righteousness will do away with death. Forever in the future. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now there was a certain man who was sick. The word sick here, he's, uh, he's impotent, he's helpless, he's in affliction, he has a malady. It's a disease or malady for which there is no cure. It's going to bring about his death. Who else has a disease, a malady, a sickness that will bring about death for which there is no cure? All of us, all of us. So, no, no, make no mistake about that. You know, my body is corrupting. And uh, <laughs> as each day arises, I have my POD. What's a POD? Pain of the day. And my, at my age, every time I awake, I have a different pain somewhere else every day. Just indicating for me that this body is already in a corrupted state. It's corrupting, it's rotting, it's failing me. Like Lazarus. Something, unless Jesus comes for me to take me and allow me to jump off this earth, when we call that the rapture, I pray everybody believes in the rapture. It's something you believe in your heart, but you can't explain with your head, right? But if Jesus doesn't come in the rapture soon, I'll probably some affliction, some malady is going to take me out of this world. 
like Lazarus, a certain man sick. Lazarus is the Greek. What was his Hebrew name? Same name as the man we talked about last week, Eleazar. And it means God is my helper. God is my helper. God is my comfort. That's what his name means, Lazarus. And surely God is going to be his helper in a way that he would never have expected. And where is he from? He is from Bethany. And Bethany means? Beth is house. Bethany means house of poverty. This affliction that would bring death to this man who resides in the house of poverty. What other afflicted people might reside in a place of poverty? Spiritually impoverished. We certainly don't. Now, now, if you don't recognize that something is seriously wrong in our society, in our nation, in our world today, then you have your head in the sand. Is it not true that we live now more than ever before in an impoverished nation? And I'm not talking about materially. I'm talking about spiritually. So this Lazarus, this man in need of God's help, represents you and I. Surely represents the, G- Jesus, the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, at the writing, John knew that there was a number of people who understood and knew who Lazarus, Mary and Martha were, of, from, of the town of Bethany. Where was Bethany? Any idea? Outside. Just two miles outside of Jerusalem. That's right. Two miles from Jerusalem. And it says, and it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped her, his feet with her hair, whose brother was Lazarus, who was sick. Now, uh, we obviously realize that John, so John presupposes that his audience already knows who this Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are. They already know that Martha is the, or Mary is the one who anointed Jesus with that precious spikenard oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Why? Because go to chapter 12 for a moment. And it tells us there, verse 3, then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. Well, so it was yet to take place as far as the chronology of the book goes. But John knows that his readers already are aware of what had taken place because this is written past tense. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now where was Jesus? Remember, he was there where John was baptizing. What do we call that place? Bethabara, that's right, Bethabara. Now, if you weren't in that study, it is well worth your time to go back and listen to the message with regard to how significant this place was, Bethabara, the place or the house of passage, and how significant it was that Jesus was there. Why? Because that was a very, very special place in the life of our Lord, where John the Baptist was baptizing there, Bethabara. So he's about 20 miles from Bethany. He's about 20 miles from where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lay sick. How long would it take him to get to Bethany? A 20-mile journey? Casually, two days. If he's really in a hurry, he could probably do it in a day. They were in much better shape than you and I are. They walked everywhere, you see. We have trouble just walking from the living room to the refrigerator sometimes, don't we? <laughs> Therefore the sister sent him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So Jesus is indicating that they should not fear, they should not be overly concerned or overly anxious, that God said, this is not unto death. It surely won't be unto eternal death because they believe in Jesus. Now, they sent a messenger to Jesus. He had to go from Bethany to Bethabara to give Jesus the message that this Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. By the time he got to Jesus, we know from the the account that's recorded for us here, Lazarus was 
dead. He was dead already. The messenger didn't know that. Jesus certainly knew that. But the messenger made his trip on the first day to inform Jesus of the sickness of Lazarus. By the time he got to Jesus, Lazarus was dead. And Jesus declares, for the sickness is not unto death. Aren't we glad? The power of sin and the sting of sin, or the power of sin is death, the sting of death, no longer has any power over us. Aren't we glad? We were dead while we yet lived. And that Jesus, how Jesus describes those who are in unbelief. He'd look at them and he'd say, look, they are dead, walking dead while they yet believe. But as far as Jesus was concerned, and the reality of it was that Lazarus was not dead. Lazarus was still alive. Now, Jesus loved the uh, Mary, Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. This, the first indication there that this was the man whom Jesus loved, the word is phileo, meaning a fondness or affection, brotherly love. But here it says, verse 5, now Jesus loved agapeo. He loved Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus. And so when he had heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. What? What kind of love is this? Jesus heard he was sick, and he stays two more days at Bethabara before he even attempts to begin to make his way to Bethany. Now listen to me and listen closely, because today... Today, most love with a uh, pampering love. Children are, don't get me wrong, ladies, please, but they're mothered far too long. It's not a mothery or a, a pampering love. Pam it's a perfecting love. It's a maturing love. Jesus allows the harder things of life to come into our life, to perfect us, to mature us, to grow us, to strengthen us. And let me say once again, you young moms, if, if you have a male child, and, and make no mistake, there's a way in which you determine the gender of your child. <laughs> if you have a male child, you can birth a male child, but you can't make a man out of him. It takes a man to produce another man. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Too many of our male children have been mothered and pampered to the point to where they're no longer men. That's just an aside. But Jesus' love is not a pampering love. It's a perfecting love. It's not a mothering love. It's a maturing love. And he stayed two more days in that place where he was. And then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Why would that have been a problem? To go to Judea. You've all read the text ahead of time, didn't you? What did, what did you say, Carolyn? They wanted, to kill him. they wanted to murder him. They've already attempted to kill him three times. And the raising of Lazarus from the dead is going to assure that they make the decision to kill him. But it's all in God's timetable, isn't it? And no one takes my life. He said, I lay it down. That's right. And he said, let us go to Judea again. Verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? Are you crazy? They're going to kill you. You're a wanted man. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. We're to walk in the light of the truth of God's word. And as we do, we have nothing to fear. No situation, no circumstance, no individual. No, we have, we can't, don't even have to fear the devil, do we? No. But if you're not walking in the light of his truth, then you're walking in darkness, then you have every reason to fear. But Jesus said, no, 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 now the light is with you. And we, we discussed at length how Jesus is the light of the world. How in Genesis 1, the first three verses of Genesis chapter 1 describe the work of the Trinity, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus the Son. For God so, right, loved the world, but God is the creator of this world. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep and brought about creation. And the light would come forth, light be. And we know that that light was Jesus Christ. 
the only light, true light, that's in the world before the stars, the moon, before the heavens were created? Jesus manifests his light. And that's what he's talking about here. Now, it's very, very important that you're not presuming upon the grace of God and the opportunity that you have to be walking in that light. We have the Holy Spirit in us, the light of Jesus Christ. Is that right? So we have a capacity to display to the world supernatural qualities that only Jesus could give us. What would one of those be? One of those supernatural qualities that you have the capacity to display to manifest that, that an unbeliever does not. Patience. Patience. That's a good one. Patience. Yeah, the hupomone, right? You know what the hupomone is, right? Where you're, you're under a load or a pressure or a stress, but you don't want to cut and run. You're patiently enduring that to discover what is it that God wants to do in my life through this, through this suffering, through this affliction. What might be one of those other things that we can display, manifest supernaturally that an unbelieving world cannot? The chief attribute of God, love, joy. Joy is associated with that. A joy that is unspeakable, a joy that is not dependent upon our circumstances. Isn't that right? A joy that is innate within you. But most importantly, love. We can love our... How you doing? How much family strife is there? What, what, what holiday is coming up very soon? Who's getting roasted? The turkey or some family member? You know. No, no, I'm serious. Listen, I'm serious. We, we have the capacity to display a love that the world cannot understand, that an unbeliever could never manifest to those who may not love us. We can love the unlovable, and we can love those who hate us. We can love our enemies. Now listen, more than ever before, more than ever before, our nation needs to see the uniting love of Jesus Christ. Yeah. <sighs> Dare I go here? I'm not pro-vax. I'm not anti-vax. I am anti-mandate. You understand? But what is driving me crazy is the division you are allowing the enemy to bring about through this vaccine. Stop it. Okay? All right, good. (laughs) Hey, if you're vaxxed, I love you. If you're unvaxxed, I love you. Either way, you're praying for God's will, right? You're dependent upon God, whether you're vaxxed or unvaxxed. Look at the division that it's causing among families. Every year we're invited to a particular Thanksgiving feast and I got to call and find out if we're, are you going to allow my wife and I to come? Vaxxed, unvaxxed. Some people are being kept from family unity. Stop it. You're going to die. Get over it. <laughs> now I'm not, saying to be, I'm not saying to be foolish, Okay. I, I'm not, but, but it's, it's a really a matter of conscience. Make, do all of the study you want to do. Do all of the research, and you'll find out your head will spin in confusion. Who is right? God is. So whatever God tells you to do, do it. Okay? Enough of that. What kind of love is this that you would stay two more days there at Beth ministering to these people when Lazarus, whom you say you agapeo, is lying sick in bed? Well, God knew what he was going to do, didn't he? And and listen, he loved Mary and Martha, and he wasn't going to keep them from the suffering, from the pain, from the sorrow, from the grief that was going to come, because they they were going to see last. Have you ever been by the bedside of someone you loved dearly and watched them exhale for the last time? Oh, it rips you up. 15 years ago, and it's as, it's as fresh now as it was 15 years ago when I heard that. And then no more. That's painful. But I am so thankful. One day, that wound is going to be completely healed over. Jesus loved Martha and Mary, and you enough 
to not take away the difficult consequences and circumstances of life that are going to perfect you, perfect your relationship with Jesus, that are going to mature you and mature your relationship with one another. Is God looking for a perfection of performance? No. no. Who could do that? <laughs> I had a young man audaciously tell me yes. <laughs> we won't go there. But no, he's not looking for a perfection of performance that's an impossibility. You understand that, don't you? The more you try to conquer over your flesh, what happens? The more frustrated you become? Hmm? The more in defeat you are? No, 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 no. You, you, can never def- you can never, first of all, you never defeat the flesh with the flesh. You defeat the flesh with the spirit by focusing on Jesus. Now, Jesus doesn't want a perfection of your performance. He wants a perfection of relationship. And through those sufferings, through those deep sufferings of soul, you ever have a dark night of the soul? But then you, you heard that song from the spirit? in the darkness of the soul that perfected and matured the relationship you have with him, that strengthened your faith and your trust in him and him alone. It was through those difficulties, through that suffering, through that sorrow, through that pain that God shows himself faithful. Yeah. Let us go to Dujia. But Jesus, they wanted to stone you there. Verse 9, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Walk in Jesus, beloved. When you're tempted to manifest your flesh, whatever whatever it may be, whatever the situation may be, stop. Stop and say, Lord, I know I have the capacity now to display what you shared, what you shared, folks. A patience that is supernatural. A joy that's unspeakable, can't be understood. A love that could never be explained, but surely experienced. Help us to do that, Lord. That's walking in the light of this world. That's walking in Jesus. Verse 11, these things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend. And this is very, this is, don't, don't look at this friend as being something very casual. This is very precious. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness, right? And then he was called a friend of God. Who are the friends of God? Who are the friends of Jesus? Those who obey him, who believe him. Turn with me to chapter 15 for a minute of John's gospel. Chapter 15. Yeah, go to verse 11. Chapter 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy remain in you and that your joy may be full. That's that supernatural joy we're talking about. And this is my commandment, verse 12, that you love agapeo one another as I have agapeo as I have loved you unconditionally, sacrificially. That's that supernatural love we're talking about. There's so much division. Everything is political these days. You can't watch a sports program without it becoming political. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. I call Abraham my friend because he believed me in his heart. Jesus calls you his friend because you believe him in your heart. You are my friends if you do what I have commanded you to do. And that's the way in which we show our love for Jesus is through our obedience to his word. Seeking to know him and to make him known. No longer do I call you servants. Verse 15, now in particular to our conversation. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I have commanded you, that you love one another. Asking in his name, I just want to be careful you understand this because the word of faith, people twist that scripture so badly, they mutilate it. They interpret that to say any fleshly desire you have, all you have to do is ask God, command it of God and he has to give it to you. Is that what we're talking about? Nay, never, no. Asking in his name is asking in accordance with his nature. The very things he would ask for as he's working through you, in you. The first Johannian epistle records that for us. Then you receive what you want when you ask in his nature. 
loving God and loving others more than we love our own selves. But here he indicates Lazarus was his friend as Abraham was his friend because he believed God as you are his friends because you believe God and therefore as his friends he no longer calls you servants. What does he do? He reveals to you everything he's about to do. Now, if you were here on Wednesday night when we went through Daniel chapter 7, I went through uh, uh, quickly a lot of apocalyptic literature just to indicate for you the time in which we're in, that Jesus has revealed to us exactly what's going to take place, that, that we can interpret the news, we can give commentary on the daily news now through the Word of God, through the prophetic word, more appropriately, eschatology, or the apocalyptic literature of the Bible, and it is so encouraging to me that he's told me ahead of time, and I know it's all true in my heart. And I take great encouragement. Yesterday at the men's study, we're in Jeremiah. Where are we in Jeremiah? That's right, chapter 49. And, and in chapter 48, chapter 49, in the subsequent chapters, he's, he's judging the surrounding nations that are surrounding Israel for the treatment of God's people, Israel. The court is seated, and the judge is judging. Who's, who's seated? What court? The court in heaven. And who's seated? Who's the judge? God himself. Now, that was the micro of the macro. That judgment of those nations immediately surrounding Israel in the Old Testament that's already passed history is, is indicative, is type and sign and symbol of what's going to be taking place very near in the future when God begins to judge the nations of this world and makes the nations and the kingdoms of this world the nations, the kingdoms of his Christ, his Messiah. Because in Daniel chapter 7, it tells us the day in which we're in right now that the court will be seated and the judge very soon will begin to make his judgments. I find that comforting when we are in such an unjust world. I find that so comforting when the corruption is so pervasive. I find that comforting when my government is more a criminal agency empire than it is a government for the people, by the people, of the people. Government was established to punish evildoers and to reward or commend good. Our government is doing just the opposite today. Why is there such lawlessness and such violence in our society? Because it's permitted. Now, if I wasn't a saved man, I'd have to get a, a couple of six guns and do something about this, you know? <laughs> That's why I love, don't you love old westerns? A bad guy always gets it, right? These, these, these new stories, sometimes evil wins over, and you say, what is that about? Hmm. I call you friends. Why? For I have revealed to you everything that the fathers revealed to me. And, now listen, if you're a good student of the Bible, and, and the only time you're in the Bible is Wednesday night and Sunday night or Saturday morning, fellas, when you're with, you're not in it enough. You're getting bombarded by a worldly, satanically inspired message every single day in a multitude of ways, a plurality of ways. You need to carve time out to sit alone with the Lord and let him begin to comfort your heart. I am, I am overjoyed at the time in which I live in. Why? Why? Because that kingdom's passing away and this kingdom is coming. See those flags? For 2,000 years, the church had been praying, our Father who art in heaven. And that's what he's doing. His name is going to be glorified. His kingdom is coming. Do you understand that? We're going to realize, if, if you're here any length of time at all now, you're going to realize the truthfulness or the answer to that prayer, thy kingdom come. So I want to encourage you once again, walk in the light. Don't play, do not play fast and loose with the Lord. It will not benefit you. If you will violate God's love through his word in any area, Satan in your flesh knows you're prone to violate God's word and love in every area. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Back to the text. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Now, well, with the coming of Jesus Christ, the death of those who believe, saints, is always referred to as sleep. 
the older I get, the more I enjoy a good night's sleep because so often it escapes me. You know, <laughs> I don't know about you. I think uh, was it Friday night? I got two hours sleep, but I make good use of the time. You know, and then last night, oh, I slept like a baby rocking in a cradle. You know, I didn't want to get up this morning, but I did. <laughs> but it, I take great comfort in the fact that the Lord says that my passing from this life to the next is like sleep. I enjoy a good night's sleep. Took it for granted when I was young. But boy, I sure enjoy it now. Don't you? Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, all right. You know what I'm talking about. These things he said after that. He said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said to him, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. You know, our dear Frankie had bronchitis, and then she had pneumonia, and I kept telling her, you got to rest, you got to rest, you got to rest, you got to rest, you know? David, how's Frankie doing? Well, you know, oh boy, you know, we'd get upset because she's out doing things, and then you say, well, no, she's home resting, I praise God. Because if you're sick and you're sleeping, you're getting strengthened, you're, you're healing, right? Hey, I don't like medication. I don't like mind-altering drugs. Do you? I used to. That was 41 years ago. <laughs> but now uh, I've had more surgeries than I'd like to talk about since 2008. But every time I have a surgery, they give, me, they give me a bottle of pills to take away the pain from the surgery. And, you know, I had a major back surgery in 2008, and I didn't want to take those pills. But you know what happened? I had to go back to Atlanta to the surgeon because the pain got overwhelming. I, I, I didn't control it. I didn't manage it. He, he said, listen, I'm a Christian too, but let me explain to you something, Pastor. You need to take these just for a short time to relieve your body of the pain so your body can focus energy on your healing rather than on the pain. Oh, well, that makes sense to me now. So, I, listen, I, I know I just explained that, you know, we, we, there's some practical teaching here, too. So, don't be afraid to take what your, what your doctor prescribes so that you can sleep, so that you can rest, so that your body will be free of pain and can rest so that you can be restored, strengthened, and renewed. It makes sense, doesn't it? I've had to explain that to a number of people. You know, I understand your fear, but don't worry. The Holy Spirit keep you from being addicted. And if, and if your spouse tells me the problem, we'll keep you from being addicted. <laughs> Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Why did he wait two days? Why did he allow Mary and Martha to suffer this anguish, this pain? Why now is he telling his disciples, he's dead, the guy's dead. We're going to a funeral. Listen, in each case, he's trying to strengthen and build their faith in him, in his word, that his word is true. Be, beyond what you believe, beyond the circumstance, beyond the situation, beyond those things that you can, you can only comprehend with your mind, but not with your heart. You have to have faith in me. I believe Jesus is coming for me. Do you? I believe he's coming very soon, and I'm going to jump off this earth. Do you? Yes. Praise the Lord, because it's true. Now, I could give you an apologetic and proof text for the fact that that is going to take place. Yeah, that's what he's doing here. He's building faith in Mary and Martha, building faith in his disciples. He's going to be building faith in those Jews who witness the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. And you will never convince them ever again that Jesus doesn't have power over the grave, that the resurrection from the dead isn't real. Hmm. When my, my first wife, my beloved Roberta, she was suffering from cancer, and, and she wanted to know everything she could know about heaven. I mean, that's a reasonable thing, right? You know, when you go on vacation, you want to know everything you're going to know. You know, where, where to visit, where to go, where the best spots, to, you know, where to eat. <laughs> so we read three books together on heaven before she passed. Oh, I, would, I have never, ever, ever in my life been more assured of heaven and life after death than I have been since 2008, 2006, actually. That's what Jesus is doing. Do you, do you have an absolute assurance that you're as dead now as you're ever going to be? Do you have an absolute assurance of knowing this is the worst that will ever be for you and I, but the best is yet to head? For the unbeliever, it's just the opposite. It's true. This will be the best ever. Enjoy it. Because this is the best that will ever be for the unbeliever. He's dead. Verse 15, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, 
that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So he wanted to strengthen their faith in him and in his word. You need to be constantly strengthened in the word. Every miracle that Jesus performed, every miracle that is performed in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, is for the purpose of supporting the veracity, the truthfulness, the validity of the word of God. Do you understand? Where you have to, faith comes by, hearing by, not by miracles. No group of people ever saw more miracles than did the Jews coming out of the Exodus, out of Egypt. God performed miraculous signs and wonders on behalf of these people, and then they wandered for 40 years in unbelief. It didn't produce faith. The word of God produces faith, but he'll use miracles to draw people to the word. And this is what he's doing. I'm glad for your sakes that that we were not there, but that you may believe. And, And that's the emphasis of this chapter. It's believing, 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 believing. Then Thomas, this is Doubting Thomas, who is called Didymus, a twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. (laughs) They didn't get it, did they? How often Jesus speaks in spiritual terms, but they're just relating in in the physicalness of this world, and so often we do the same thing. So he's thinking, well, if Jesus is going to go to Judea and they're going to stone him, he's going to, well, let's die, die with him, okay? We would like to think we would die for the Savior, don't we? Of all of the apostles that were there that day, and it was the 12, there was only one who really showed he would die for him. Which one was that? John. One was a betrayer, and he knew that from the beginning. Jesus knew that from the beginning. The other 10 fled for their lives. They would not die for him. John, however, chose to die with the Savior if necessary. John alone with the women was at, were at the cross. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Now, listen close to me. We would all like to think we'd die for Jesus, right? But how do you have the assurance of knowing you will die for him if you're living for him today? Let me repeat that. You will have the assurance of knowing that you would die for Jesus if you're living for him today. Living in accordance with his word where he would call you friend. Amen? So Thomas didn't get it, but they will. Verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for days. The messenger came, that was the first day, right? Lazarus is already dead. Jesus waited two days. So it was the second day after uh, he got the news that he started on his way. And it was the fourth day that he ended up in Bethany. So that's why he was dead four days in the tomb. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him. But Mary was sitting in the house. There's Mary's and there's Martha's, right? Which are you? You know, Martha's an activist. You know, I always have to be doing something. You know, I just, you talk to my wife, she'll tell you that. The, the hardest thing for me to do is just sit and study. But I do it. I do it because I love it, but, but it's very difficult because I always want to be doing things. I always want to be getting things accomplished. I want to product. I'm an activist, you know? But there are those who are contemplative. Now, that's my son. My son is a contemplative man. He can sit in a closet with his books for days. He'll forget to eat. That was Mary. Martha, the activist. Got to be doing something, right? Some of you ladies are like that. Mary, contemplative. She just wanted to sit and just think about these things, ponder them. As Mother Mary, Jesus, the mother of Jesus, did all so often. Verse 21, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. Psalm 50 declares that, doesn't it? If we cry out to God, God will answer, and then we will be encouraged in seeing the glory of God and the answer to our prayers. And that's what Martha is indicating here. Even now we know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. The again is not in the Greek text. Your brother will rise. 
Martha was of the sect of Jews who believed in the resurrection of life. They believed in life after death. They believed in heaven and hell. They believed in angels and demons. They would be taught that by the sect of the Pharisees, right? That's why they were so fair, you see, right? But Caiaphas, who we'll read about a little later on, he was of the sect of the Sadducees. They were materialists. They believed this is all there is. Eat, drink, and be merry, for when you die, it's over. Annihilation. Cease to exist. That's why they were so sad, you see. That's right. That's right. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said, I know, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, this is the fifth tetragrammaton. What is the tetragrammaton? The I am statement. The tetragrammaton is a four letter Hebrew letter word for God. I am. When he came to Moses, who shall I say sent me? I am. Who I am. I am your ever becoming one. I am whatever you need me to be. Anybody ever do a study on the names of God? And how all of those names of God represent some way in which he meets a need in our life? Yeah. This is what he's saying. I am the resurrection and the life. I am God. I am the one, the eternal. I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe that? You have resurrection life. Because resurrection life is not a doctrine. Although it's a doctrine described in the scriptures. Resurrection life is a person. When you have the person of Jesus Christ through the second person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, residing in your life, you have eternal life. It's not that it's yet future. It is now. Do you understand? And that's the emphasis that Jesus was trying to bring to Martha. Yes, Martha, I know that you believe that your brother will raise in the resurrection of the dead, the believing dead, but I'm telling you right now, he is alive through my resurrection power. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. Christos is the, Hebrew, is the Greek for what Hebrew word? Mashiach, the Messiah. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Where's the first place that the Son of God is really used to indicate the work and the ministry of the Messiah? We were there Wednesday night. Daniel, good, good, you remember. Okay, very good. No, you don't. (laughs) The Christ, the Son of God, which is a title for the Messiah, at first used in the Old Testament, and Jesus used it to refer to himself many times over the Messiah who is to come into the world. And she's saying, I believe you are the answer to all that the prophets had declared with the one who would come greater than Moses. Even Moses foretold of the Messiah and his coming. And so those who believed in the promises of God with regard to the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God who would come for the salvation of the world, they would die in faith and they received salvation on credit. Right? Because they'd go down into Sheol, Hades. But that salvation, that redemption, wasn't really realized until the coming of the Christ. There was a temporary covering for their sin by belief in the Old Testament promises with regard to the Messiah and obeying the Levitical system of sacrifice when one sinned. So there was a temporary covering. What do we call that? A kofar. Where is that word used somewhere else? The kofar? It was the pitch that was used to seal the ark, to seal them. The kofar. So there was a temporary kofar until the coming of Christ. Then there's that complete remission of your sin. Not a covering over. They're gone. Hallelujah. (laughs) Verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went away and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you, the rabbi. What's the problem with this? Secretly calling Mary, the teacher has come. Anybody recognize the problem here? Rabbis would never speak to a woman in public. A Pharisee was not permitted to even address his daughter or his wife in public. Did you know that? The liberation of women came through the ministry of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that. 
So Jesus is calling Mary, but he's calling her secretly because there's a number of Jews. Now, they're only two miles from Jerusalem. They're already seeking to kill him. They've already attempted to kill him three times now. And, and the concern is that if they understand that Jesus is there, they're going to go and tell the authorities. Because not all of them were believers who were there in Martha and Mary's house that day. So he wants to meet with her secretly, but that couldn't happen. Here's why. Then when Mary came where Jesus was, verse 32, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The only recorded words of Mary, but every, every time we read about Mary of Bethany and her encountering Jesus, she's always at his feet. Contemplative. Hey, we're all, we all should be Marys to some degree, right? We should all be at his feet, learning of the Lord, experiencing the Lord. God is not so concerned about what you're doing for him. The Holy Spirit gives you all of the gifts, talents, the energy, the desire, the ability to do what God wants you to do as far as ministry is concerned. What he is concerned about is who you are before him. Are you too busy to spend time with him? Are you too busy to be sitting at his feet? Bad trade-off. That's how you suffer burnout in ministry. You, you can get weary in ministry. I, I've, I've gotten weary in ministry. But I have never, in 30 years now, never been weary of ministry. Why? Why? Because I have the privilege and the joy of sitting at his feet continually. How could I possibly grow weary of being ministered to directly by the Savior? Now, when you begin to experience that, you'll know. You, you'll, you could never, ever, ever grow weary of being his follower. Weary of being a Christian. Weary of being his son or daughter. You can get weary in life the life that not God has now given you, but you will never get weary of your Christian life. You understand what I'm saying to you? There's something wrong when men get weary of ministry. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. You know what that word groan means? <clears throat> <clears throat> to snort in anger, like a bull, you know, an angry bull. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jesus, we don't, we don't picture him that way, do we? No. There's other texts there. Jesus is, is so angry. It's like, a, you like those fantasy movies and the special effects, you know, that, the latest Kong movie. I really enjoyed the special effects in that because that Kong looks so real, didn't he? And, and then you, you notice when his nostrils flare to fire in his eyes and... <laughs> that, that's the word here. Check it out. Don't believe me. Get your Greek lexicon. Jesus snorted in anger. What's he angry about? Death. death. The pain of death. The, the problems sin causes. One woman's sin causes us all this inconvenience. <laughs> you know, we get angry about it, right? No, I pray for the woman, but, but <laughs> I get so angry at Satan, <laughs> so angry at sin. Don't you? Yeah. Hmm? That's what Jesus was angry about. But he also, listen, Jesus was fully God, fully man, and he felt their compassion. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice, aren't we? But also, we're to weep with those who weep. And look what the text tells us. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come see. And what happened? And then he began to weep. You know, did you ever notice the close association between getting angry and then getting sorrowful? Hmm? I mean, just, it seems like it's a flip of a switch sometimes. And that's what happened to Christ. He's so angry at sin and the result of sin and the work of the enemy. 
But then he's so compassionate and tenderhearted for those who are suffering such anguish, such loss, such pain. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And, and he didn't weep like these professional mourners, you know, these women who were in the house with Mary and Martha mourning the death of Lazarus. It was loud, you know. You ever see anybody in the Middle East mourning? I mean, it's loud. I told Gail, when I die, you hire professional mourners. I want all of Greenville to hear you mourning for me. <laughs> no. But here, here's describing that Jesus just shed quietly tears, grief. Sometimes grief is expressionless, right? Sometimes the pain and the grief is so much you, 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 you don't have words. I need to wrap it up, don't I? Then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Well, next week. <laughs> but I want to mention one other thing before we part. What we should all take away from this is, is the heart of our Savior who loves us so. We are the afflicted, the diseased, the decaying. We are Lazarus, dead, but now we're alive. Lazarus in need of God's help, but we are comforted knowing that whatever affliction, suffering, or trial we go through in this life, no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, Jesus will comfort us. He'll be with us through that for the purpose of perfecting and maturing our faith. He's not pampering. He's not overmothering. But he's a father, a good, good father who takes us through the lessons of life so that we can be strengthened and perfected. Amen? Now, that's, that's what's important here. But why, why the two days? Next week. Next week, you come back and tell me why two days. It has an eschatological significance that will blow you away. Pastor David, do you have a closing song for us? Shall we stand?